Hi friends, it's Deanna Willison with Our Blooming Catholic Life, and we're here with our first look at Psalm 50, Miserere, right? The fourth penitential psalm, verses 7 through 9. Let's begin as we always do with St. Francis's prayer before the San Damiano crucifix. Let's see if we can get that a little better. There we go. In nomine Patri, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Summe glorioso Deus, illumina tenebras cordis mehi, et da mihi fidem rectum, spem certain et caritatum perfectum, domini ut facium tuum sanctum et verax mandatum. Amen. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins did my mother conceive me. For behold, thou hast loved truth, the uncertain and hidden things of thy wisdom thou hast made manifest to me. Thou shalt sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be cleansed. Thou shalt wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins did my mother conceive me. For behold, thou hast loved truth, the uncertain and hidden things of thy wisdom thou hast made manifest to me. Thou shalt sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be cleansed. Thou shalt wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins did my mother conceive me. For behold, thou hast loved truth, the uncertain and hidden things of thy wisdom thou hast made manifest to me. Thou shalt sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be cleansed. Thou shalt wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. Friends, here, uh, the, the first line, line seven, for behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins did my mother conceive me. I admit that line has always puzzled me. And I don't know if it's how King David meant it, but it's a meditation on how this is speaking to me in my life. And what it speaks to me of is for David, um, remember he was chosen as the anointed priest king of Israel. And his mother then would have been the nation of Israel as well as his biological mother. And and so here I'm thinking... Um, you know, my generation, I'm Gen X, we're always saying in the church that we were the coloring pictures of Jesus' generation. We were not given the Baltimore Catechism. We were barely given any uh, formation in the faith. What we had was, I remember when we had the nuns, that there was something going on, but I cannot tell you for the life of me what they taught us. What I do remember is they gave us a personal testimony and a witness and that when we made our first communion, the nuns enrolled us in the scapular. And it's, I did not wear it the whole time too. I don't know when I stopped wearing it. It was a very big deal to get a rosary and a scapular at your first communion. And I remember the ceremony to be invested in the brown scapular. It was down in the, the church hall. And we kind of all lined up and did that after the mass. Um, and the priest blesses. And I remember that. I don't remember when I stopped wearing it. I only wore it again. After a number of years, you'd see them in Catholic bookshops when I'd go on retreats. And I wondered what they were. And I had to do some studying up. And of course, I remember being invested in the brown scapular. Um, and before that, I'd worn ah, the four-way medal, which is sort of the medal of the scapular as well. It has some of the things on it. And some people count that. But it's really just if you're completely allergic to wool that you would wear that. If you're not allergic to wool, you're expected to wear the brown scapular. And that's what the, the little strings are that you normally see here are the, the scapular strings. Um, and, and it's something that the Lord, as we say here, for behold, thou hast loved truth, the uncertain and hidden things of thy wisdom, thou hast made manifest to me. And I give thanks to God for over the years, he has made up whatever was deficient in my my training, my post-Vatican II formation. Now, whether, whose fault that was, I don't know. I can't speak to that exactly. I know I know the nuns taught us for most of the time, and after that, it was the young adults of the parish kind of took over. And I can't say why I didn't learn more. Maybe it's just my thick head. I don't really know, but I know a lot of the things were missing. I used to ask my grandmother, why do you do this in the mess? Why do you do that in the mess? And she, in fact, would tell me she was the one who would let me know those things. Um, but we didn't have, not not the solid memorized Baltimore Catechism. We didn't really have the experiential 
catechism. I'm not sure. I remember doing workbooks. That's why I remember doing workbooks. And I remember the conversations. But it not it interesting? The only things that truly stuck with me, besides the sacraments of uh, communion and penance, uh, confirmation, I will say I did not really understand that. I thought it was a rite of passage, similar to other religions. I didn't realize what it was. I thought it was a coming of age thing. And then it's really confusing why sometimes little kids can get confirmed or infants. And that doesn't make sense to me because it's not a rite of passage. That is not what that is. Um, so it was, it was co communion and penance were the things that I believe I did really take to heart and understand, um, in the faith. And I remember that witness of, of God saves from the one nun. I just really took that to heart. And and I had this vague memory of the rosary and the brown scapular. And although I didn't remember the teaching of what those things were, and I prayed the rosary in a very rote fashion, and I don't know what happened to mine. Um, and I had a little glow in the dark nativity scene that hung up in a window. But I remembered those moments. And now as an adult, I could go back and learn them more. Why? Because the uncertain and hidden things of thy wisdom thou hast made manifest to me. God has showed me. He's unpacked for me on my journey. And I know a lot of you feel the same way. We feel kind of robbed that we didn't have a good formation, but perhaps it has fueled a hunger in us now. Unfortunately, there were many years that were wasted that we did not fully live our faith. And I have regret and penance needs um, around that. So then we get to, to line nine. Thou shalt sprinkle me with hyssop and I shall be cleansed. Thou shalt wash me and I shall be made whiter than snow. And the hyssop has a very particular meaning. I know I looked this this um, hyssop up during my last Ignatian retreat. Looking up hyssop in the Bible. Okay, almost every Bible study is kind of interesting. There's so much more in here. Like everybody has it. What is hyssop? There are 21 Bible verses that mention it. What is it? Um, this website says it's an herb that is native to the Mediterranean region. Mentioned several times, old and new. It's brought up most often in relation to the process of being clean. So what is it? It's an evergreen plant. Originally grew up in, in the Southern Europe, Middle East, and Central Asia. It's classified as being in the mint family. It's a perennial, so it can survive for several years. Um, it grows in summer. It flowers, blooms in different colors, violet, white, or red. It has valuable flavoring and medicinal properties. A distinctive bitter taste. It adds a warmth to foods like salads, fish, meat, and vegetables. And use an ingredient as des in desserts, honey, and even some liquors. Is not helped with physical problems in the throat, nose, and lungs. It can be applied to bruises on top of the skin as a healing balm. So why? They used it in Egypt, in Exodus. So I don't know if this one is a reference back to Exodus. Exodus 12, 22. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and both sides of the door frame. None of you should go out of the door of your house until morning. And that was a way to mark them as part of the chosen people of God, that they were covered by the blood of the lamb that was dipped in the hyssop. Why? Why was that? It's used in Leviticus over and over. Why hyssop? Um, if you had a defiling disease, they used hyssop, cedar wood, and scarlet yarn. And there were other things. Constantly hyssop, hyssop, hyssop. Why is his a part of the ritual washing? Um, let's go back see what some others say. What? What's with his up? Let's see here. It's used symbolically. That God used it as a sort of a paintbrush, possibly because it was sturdy and it, you could use it. But it also marked because it was used in cleansing. Ah, this is interesting. This one says because it was used in cleansing and they were painting the blood on with it, it meant that God was marking his people as pure and not targets of the judgment God was about to deal. The Egyptians. Interesting. So he's saying, God, cleanse me even spiritually as I confess my sin. It does say that uh, they used it as well when Jesus was on the cross and asking for a drink. 
that is what they asked him for was also that hyssop, which is very interesting. And kind of bookends it used in Exodus to mark the purity and with blood. And then on the cross, it was used with wine to give to that perfect, back to that perfect lamb. Just a lot to think about there on hyssop. And so I'm going to let that go. I think all three of these verses have are so rich, you can easily spend your week just pondering them. Let's read them again, and then we'll do St. Francis's, you know what, let's leave St. Francis's prayer off for today. I'm going to read these verses again as it's Monday, and we'll just, just do a little sign of the cross and go. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins did my mother conceive me. For behold, thou hast loved truth. The uncertain and unhidden, uncertain and hidden things of thy wisdom thou hast made manifest to me. Thou shalt sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be cleansed. Thou shalt wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. And no new patries. I feel the spirit.